Hi, science friends. I'm so glad you're watching today. Hello to everyone. And how are you today? We've come to our science time to laugh and sing and play. And when you're up, you're up. Put your hands way up high. And when you're down, you're down. And when you're only halfway up, you're neither up nor down. So roll your hands so very, very slow. And then roll your hands so very, very fast. Give your hands a clap, 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 and lay them in your lap, lap, lap. I'm so glad you're here with me today, friends. Let's check out the science bag. Are you ready? Let's see what's in here. Oh, it's heavy today. I can already tell that there's something really heavy inside. I wonder what else we can learn about what's in there without looking. Let's investigate. Scientists at home, are you ready? We'll use our eyes to see, our ears to hear. We'll use our nose to smell and our mouth to taste. And then we'll use our fingers to touch. And then we'll learn so much. All right, let's investigate. I already said it was heavy. I could feel that. Last time we were together, there was a feather in my science bag. This is not a feather today. This is heavy. Let me use my fingers and touch and I'll tell you what it feels like. It's very hard. It's bumpy, kind of sharp around the edges. So it's heavy, bump, sh bumpy, sharp around the edges. It's about this big. Can you see the shape? Use your eyes to observe closely, scientists, and check out the shape. It is jaggy around the edges. Let me give it a sniff. I don't smell anything through the science bag today. We'll see if we can taste it when we pull it out of the bag. I'm gonna throw this up in the air just so you can see how heavy it is. Watch close. You can tell by how hard it comes down into my hands. Did you hear that thump? And I couldn't throw it very high either. It's heavy. All right, anything else? I'll shake. Use your ears, listen close, ready? I hear the science bag moving across it because it's heavy and hard, but it doesn't seem to make a noise. Do you have a guess? Do you have a prediction of what I'm going to pull out of the bag? You can say it out loud. Are you ready? Let's see. One, two, three. Ta-da! What is that? It's a rock. Yeah, rocks are heavy, especially this one. It's so big. It's a big rock. It's bigger than my hand. It's also a jagged rock. I happen to have another rock in my pocket. Do you keep rocks in your pocket sometimes? This one, this is my special rock. I love this rock. It's not jagged and sharp like this one. It's smooth and round. I like the way it feels in my hand. I like the way that it fits right in my palm and I can wrap my hands, fingers around it and move it around and around in my palm. It just feels nice and smooth. I like to touch that and feel that in my hand. Do you have a special rock? Is it smooth or is it jagged? And why are some rocks sharp and jagged and other rocks smooth? How did this one get so smooth? I'm wondering, and you might also be wondering if you don't have a special rock, how do you find a special rock? How do you know it's special when you see it? Let's do some research. I've got a great book today called Everybody Needs a Rock by Bird Baylor with pictures by Peter Parnell. Let's see what we can learn about how to find a special rock. And why are rocks, some rocks smooth? It starts like this. Everybody needs a rock. I'm sorry for kids who don't have a rock for a friend. I'm sorry for kids who only have tricycles, bicycles, horses, elephants, goldfish, three-room playhouses, fire engines, wind-up dragons, and things like that if they don't have a rock for a friend. 
That's why I'm giving them my own 10 rules for finding a rock. Not just any rock. I mean a special rock that you find yourself and keep as long as you can, maybe forever. If somebody says, what's so special about that rock? Don't even tell them. I don't. Nobody is supposed to know what's special about another person's rock. All right, here are the rules. Rule number one, if you can go to a mountain made out of nothing but a hundred million small, shiny, beautiful, roundish rocks. But if you can't, any place will do even an alley, even a sandy road. When you're looking at rocks, don't let mothers or fathers or sisters or brothers or even best friends talk to you. You should choose a rock when everything is quiet. Don't let dogs bark or bees buzz at you. But if you do, don't worry. The worst thing you could do is go rock hunting when you are worried. Rule number three, bend over more, even more. You may have to sit on the ground with your head almost touching the earth. You have to look a rock right in the eye. Otherwise, don't blame me if you can't find a good one. Rule number four, don't get a rock that's too big. You'll always be sorry. It won't fit in your hand right and it won't fit in your pocket. A rock as big as an apple is too big. A rock as big as a horse is much too big. Rule number five, don't choose a rock that is too small. It will only be easy to lose or a mouse might eat it thinking that it is a seed. Believe me, that happened to a boy in the state of Arizona. Rule number six, the size must be perfect. It has to feel easy in your hand when you close your fingers over it. It has to feel jumpy in your pocket when you run. Some people touch a rock a thousand times a day. There aren't many things that feel as good as a rock if the rock is perfect. Rule number seven, look for the perfect color. That could be a sort of pinkish gray with bits of silvery shine in it. Some rocks that look brown are really other colors, but you only see them when you squint and when the sun is right. Another way to see colors is to dip your rock in a clear mountain stream if one is passing by. Rule number eight. The shape of the rock is up to you. There's a girl in Alaska who only likes flat rocks. Don't ask me why. I like them lumpy. The thing to remember about shapes is this. Any rock looks good with a hundred other rocks around it on a hill. But if your rock is going to be special, it should look good all by itself in the bathtub. Rule number nine, always sniff a rock. Rocks have their own smells. Some kids can tell by sniffing whether a rock came from the middle of the earth or from an ocean or from a mountain where wind and sun touched it every day for a million years. You'll find out that grown-ups can't tell these things. Too bad for them. They just can't smell as well as kids can. Rule number 10, don't ask anybody to help you choose. I've seen a lizard pick one rock out of a desert full of rocks and go sit there alone. I've seen a snail pass up 20 rocks and spend all day getting to the one it wanted. You have to make up your own mind. You'll know. All right, that's 10 rules. If you think of any more, write them down yourself. I'm going out to play a game that takes just me and one rock to play. I happen to have a rock right here in my hand.
the end. I love that book. Now you know the 10 rules for going to find your very own special rock. But of course you might go outside and look down and just see it right away. You'll know. You'll know when you see it. Did I, we were also wondering how some rocks or why some rocks are so jagged and others are so smooth. Do you know why? There were some clues in the book. The little girl said that some rocks are kissed by sun and rain and water and snow for thousands, millions of years. Do you think that running water or moving snow and ice across a rock or wind across a rock could make it go from being jagged to being smooth? Yeah. Do you think it would just take one day? One month? One year? A hundred years? A thousand years? A million years? It takes a long time, maybe a million years. So these rocks that we hold in our hand are old. Water might be have run across this rock for a million years to make it smooth. And if it kept running across the rock, it would just eat this little rock away and it would get smaller and smaller and smaller and then disappear to dust over the earth. Wind and snow and ice and water can make a rock disappear. Isn't that crazy? I have a secret though. I don't have just one special rock. I have a whole collection of special rocks. Maybe you do too. All of my rocks are smooth. They're old rocks. So that must be what I like in a rock, is a smooth rock. She, the little girl said that rocks change colors when they get wet. Have you ever noticed that? I'm gonna put some in my little tub of water here and see if that's true. Let's try, let's try this one. I'll put this one in. Oh, it did change colors. I'll try this one. That one did too. Come check it out. Let's try this one. Wow, the colors really pop when they're underwater. How about this one? Its white line becomes really bright. Let's try one more. This one. Wow, it's beautiful and stripy. Oh, I've got to do another one. The spotted one. Their colors are really bright when you put them underwater. So we know that water makes the colors look different on a rock. We also know that moving water can make a rough rock smooth. But I wonder how rocks are made. Do you know? I know one way that new rocks are formed, from a volcano. When it erupts and the lava flows down the side of the volcano and over the earth, and then the lava cools and hardens into new rock. Have you ever made a model of a volcano or a pretend volcano? That's what I did. This is my model or pretend volcano. I made this one out of Play-Doh and in the middle, I put a graduated cylinder. One that was a little smaller than this one. You could also use a beaker. These are science tools that you can use at home. A graduated cylinder or a beaker or just a cup or a jar works too. So start with that in the middle and then build your volcano model on the outside. This one I did with Play-Doh. I made another one over here. I did this one with tin foil. I just stuffed some newspaper around the jar and then covered it with tin foil to make a model of a volcano. Now, how do we make them erupt? I put something inside. 
a little bit of baking soda. And in this beaker, I have a little bit of vinegar. Do you know what happens when you mix vinegar with baking soda? It turns into something new. That's chemistry. So let's watch a chemical reaction and see if we can make our volcano erupt. Are you ready? Let's see what happens. Count down with me. Three, two, one. It did erupt. I could add more baking soda inside and pour more of my vinegar and we could make it erupt again. Maybe I'll turn it around. Let's see if there's enough of the baking soda inside. That looks great. Our model volcano looks like a real volcano, doesn't it? Yes. Do you think we can make the tinfoil volcano erupt too? All right, I'm gonna swap. Let's bring around the tinfoil. I don't want the lava to fall onto the ground. Do that carefully. Okay. I did this one a little differently. I put the vinegar with the food coloring inside in my jar and I have the baking soda this time. I wonder if the reaction will go differently when you add the baking soda to the vinegar instead of adding the vinegar to the baking soda. We're scientists, so we're curious about that. Let's observe and find out. We'll see if we can make my model volcano erupt. You ready to count down this one? Three, two, one. <laughs> oh my gosh, that looks fantastic. And it looks different. I forgot to tell you that I added an ingredient. Oh, I love that. You have to try this one. Oh no, is the lava gonna overflow my tray? It might. I added Dawn liquid soap to the vinegar this time, along with the food coloring. And it made it a bubbly eruption. That one was really fun. I wanna do that again. You should try it too. All right, geologists, see you next time. Bye.